So tonight, um, uh, we're, we're continuing in our, our uh, series of uh, community in a divided world, exploring what is spiritual community, uh, what is Sangha. And last week, we had um, a great talk, I thought, from uh, Kula Priya, uh, where he was, um, <clears throat> uh, he was asking us the sort of, uh, what, what is our experience? Why do we keep coming back? Uh, to Sangha night. Why do we keep coming back to the Sangha? What is it that attracts us? And he was drawing out this very, very uh, helpful distinction um, between the spiritual community and the group, a distinction that Sangha Akshita has uh, uh, clarified for us. Very, very helpful distinction. Um, and the, the, the distinction being that the group is in the last analysis based on power, based in power. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's functions through the power mode. This is what he was talking to us about. And power, interestingly, Sangharachita defines as the capacity to use force, the capacity to use force, and violence being the actual use of that force um, <clears throat> to negate the being of another, to negate the being of another. Whereas the love mode is the way the spiritual community functions, and the love mode uh, functions to affirm the being of others. That's what the love mode is about. So uh, Kula Priya was, was outlining this distinction for us. Uh, he came up with a, a brilliant workplace illustration of it, actually. So do listen to his talk uh, if you're interested uh, in that area. Um, he also, he also uh, made a very good point that the NHS is a group. So when we say group, it doesn't mean that it's of no value. Uh, the NHS is very, very valuable to us, isn't it? Um, but in the last analysis, it's, it's a group in the sense that, it may, that the power mode may not be uh, using violence, uh, but it's the capacity uh, to use uh, force that we're talking about. So it might just be a threat. Uh, if you don't do this, you'll lose your job. Uh, that, in the last analysis, is the power mode. Anyway, so he was asking us, what is, what is spiritual community? What, what is it uh, that brings us back? And I um, remember for myself that actually it wasn't just the way people related to me. There was something happening between uh, them, between Mitras and order members, between the Sangha, between Buddhists, that I had never encountered before. I'd never encountered it before. Um, and I was fascinated by it. I was really fascinated. Um, so what I want to talk about uh, uh, or open up um, today, tonight, is this question of what is happening in spiritual community? What is actually going on uh, between Buddhists? Um, and what is the significance of that to the world? Um, <clears throat> and in a way, uh, the best answer to this is the spiritual community, is a vibrant, uh, thriving spiritual community, just having contact uh, with a spiritual community. That's the best answer. Um, <clears throat> we've got these really helpful, um, this really helpful distinction between the group and the spiritual community, uh, very, very valuable. Uh, but those are sort of concepts. The experience uh, cannot be done justice to in concepts. So best to get an experience of a spiritual community. Um, but what, uh, what we can also use is images. Images uh, sort of uh, don't let us think we know what it is. Uh, they invite us to explore it. In actual fact, at the end of uh, Sangha night, um, we meet in groups just to hear how the groups have gone. And we're always very careful not to um, <clears throat> uh, say uh, any names of anyone who said anything, but we just check kind of what's, what's been useful, what, what's come up, so that we can kind of keep our talks relevant. And I hope, I hope you don't mind if this was you, but I thought this was lovely. Somebody, uh, somebody said, well, Sangha, it's like velvet on your head. It's like velvet on top of your head. And that really struck me because it's an experience. It's an experience. So it points to this fact that we can talk about Sangha uh, but actually in, it's an experience and that's why images are so so helpful for us because they point towards our experience they point us out of our heads and get us kind of looking at our actual experience so spiritual community is an experience essentially um, so yeah I, so I want to what I want to do is draw on an image um, uh, to explore this question what's happening in spiritual community 
Um, and it's an image from the Mahayana. Now, the Mahayana uh, is a later phase of Buddhism uh, that made explicit what was present in the Buddha's life. It made explicit the altruism and dynamism uh, that is manifestly present in the Buddha's life. Um, and the Mahayana, so this is just a, a, quick, a quick intro to anyone who's not come across the Mahayana. Um, uh, the central ideal or sort of hero of the Mahayana is the Bodhisattva, uh, the being bent on enlightenment. But this being is bent on enlightenment not just for their own deliverance, their own enlightenment, but for the benefit of all beings. Uh, check that out, that's pretty sublime, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so, as well as the Bodhisattva, uh, the goal or the aim of the Bodhisattva life is articulated in collective and social terms. The Bodhisattva is trying to build a Buddha land or a Buddha field. Yeah? So, what this means is trying to create the conditions in which people can grow and develop. It's trying to transform the world um so that other beings can develop so that's what that's how the altruism of the bodhisattva uh, the enlightenment of the bodhisattva is made explicitly explicit um, so um this is really important that there are kind of images uh, for it because uh, the central image to buddhism is the buddha uh, like this one just behind me uh, this very peaceful uh, sublime figure um, but that is not going to bring into focus uh, our altruism and possibly not dy dynamism, uh, but certainly not altruism. Uh, it's a lone solitary figure. So we need images that bring into focus uh, our altruism. So the Mahayana started to talk about building uh, the Buddha land or creating a Buddha field. Uh, that's how it talked about the spiritual life. So um, reading Sangharakshita, um, uh, I've learned many things, uh, but apparently there are four different kinds uh, of bodhisattva, four kinds of bodhisattva. And I want to, uh, I want to use this as a bit of a structure uh, to answer this question, what's happening in the spiritual community. So the first kind of bodhisattva is all sentient beings. Whoa. <laughs> so how can the goal of Buddhism uh, uh, be already what all sentient beings are? That's pretty weird, isn't it? Uh, but I'll come back to that. Uh, the second kind of bodhisattva uh, is spiritual aspirants, you and me, um, aspiring uh, to practice, put into practice uh, the Buddha's teaching. The third kind of bodhisattva are spiritual aspirants who, unlike us, uh, have made substantial spiritual progress. Well, maybe I'm just talking about me, but yeah, third kind of uh, bodhisattvas have made substantial spiritual progress. They have attained the point of irreversibility. They cannot regress on the path. They're moving inexorably towards enlightenment. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that is traditionally talked of as the arising of the bodhicitta, this, this uh, non-egoic uh, motive force that starts to, as it were, move through you. So, um, the Hinayana talks about seeing through self, but actually if you see through self, um, you, uh, you see through, you undo all the habits that, uh, with which we protect and promote self. All that energy uh, can instead pour um, uninterruptedly into the benefit, the helping of other people. So that's kind of, they're, they're, they're just different ways of talking about the same, uh, the same sort of process. And of course, altruistic, uh, drawing out the altruistic element. And then lastly, the last kind of bodhisattva um, are archetypal bodhisattvas that really, um, what they do is they articulate the sort of content of the enlightened mind, but working uh, in time for the benefit of all beings. So these are the figures that you see uh, in pictures of Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara, Tara uh, and Shitigarbha. So I'm not going to say very much about them, but I'm going to talk about uh, the first three. And um, essentially I'm going to be drawing on an image or a, a, a series of images, symbols, um, from what's called the Vimalakirti Nirdesha. It's a particular uh, sutra. 
um, of quite sort of developed Mahayana Buddhism. And we find ourselves in this sutra in a very strange world. Uh, we find ourselves in a sort of tricksy, illusory world um, where uh, you can't tell whether what you're seeing is real or it's a mirage. The Buddha teaches through magic um, <clears throat> and it's a cosmic world. So a um, bit of a weird world, what's all this about? Well, I, I think, I, I certainly feel with the pandemic, the onset of the pandemic, our normality has been shown to be illusory. Uh, we thought it was so, so uh, reliable, we would just carry on. Well, that's kind of what's been getting at, got at here, actually, that reality is much more tricksy, much, much more illusory. Uh, than we think. And if we start to see that, then we start to wake up a bit more to how things are. So it sort of unsettles our settled sense of normality, does this, this sort of... Um, and the cosmic stuff, it's a bit weird to us, uh, but it's essentially saying, so you get Buddhas in lots of different uh, universes, but it's essentially saying that Buddhism is talking about universal principles. Uh, Buddhas, uh, Buddhahood is possible for you, it's possible for anybody. Uh, that's what's being got out. Anyway, that's enough of a, an intro uh, to the Mahayana. I hope it's given you enough. If you haven't come across the Mahayana, it's given you a sort of orientation in this rather weird world. Um, but we're doing this to explore what is happening in spiritual community. Um, and I'm going to draw on the, the image uh, from this. But first of all, just talking about the first kind of Bodhisattva, um, all beings. So what is that all about? What is being got out there? It sounds like it could just be a sort of weird fantasy. But what's being got at um, is um, it's a vision of how uh, the world um, <clears throat> is seen in the love mode. Yeah, the world is seen in the love mode. Uh, uh, so it's a vision of that. So what this is getting at is one of the great problems that we contribute to any altruistic task is how we see the people we're trying to help. Yeah? One of the great problems that we contribute to any altruistic ta task is how we see the people that we are trying to help. It's a chastening uh, thought um, <clears throat> and a challenging thought, uh, but uh, that is what Buddhism is sort of getting at with this image. So a little example of this for me, uh, in my experience. So uh, lockdown, the onset of lockdown, um, <clears throat> all that tragedy sort of raging around us, totally sort of uh, unexpected. Um, <clears throat> uh, but as many people said, I too experienced a kind of, um, despite the fact that I was confined uh, within my house, within four walls, I experienced a greater sense of connection uh, this kind of uh, overwhelming sense of solidarity, which I'd never experienced to the same extent um, with human beings. So I felt more connected, even though I was physically isolated. Um, the news flooded, didn't it, with uh, acts of kindness, with acts of generosity, with appreciation. Uh, we were clapping for the NHS uh, with acts of community. Um, <clears throat> all those volunteers that put themselves forth for the, uh, for the, to help the NHS. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary time. And it really affected me, and I know it affected a lot of other people, and I'm still processing the effects of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it was like a cloud had lifted on humanity. Suddenly we were just all human beings, uh, fragile, vulnerable to biology and uh, pandemics. Um, but we were sort of united uh, in that uh, state. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, that sort of closed, closed in, didn't it? Sort of division clogged the news. Uh, complaint, uh, blame, reproach, all that sort of stuff that we're very familiar with uh, clogged the news again. And something kind of closed, largely uh, closed up again. And I don't know about you, but I sort of, I was, I was, I kind of wanted to fight that. <laughs> it didn't help, uh, but that was my sort of response. I didn't want that sort of ugly division kind of uh, returning. Um, but it took me a while to realise that that cloud that descended, or sorry, that lifted, <laughs> um, showing humanity to be different from how I tend to see it, 
That was in my mind. That was in my mind. I was bringing that cloud uh, to humanity. Um, <clears throat> it, took me, it took me quite a while to see that. Um, and then similarly, I was bringing it back in when division sort of set, uh, set in. So um, this is an example of how I tend to see the world. I tend to see it in this sort of politicized, cynical, uh, uh, sort of clouded kind of way. Um, and it's tricky, isn't it? Because if we see it like that, well, we will encounter a world that corresponds to that. So our view will be confirmed. Uh, it's not like there's sort of nothing there. It's sort of partially true. But what we're not noticing, what I was not noticing, what I am not noticing when I'm in that state, is that actually I participate, I activate it. Uh, so it's like a sort of consensus reality. Uh, we all sort of participate in it and uh, bring it into being. So that's what sort of being got at with this uh, image, uh, this, this uh, vision of how the love mode sees the world. The, the strange thing, the strange irony is that what we then do with this clouded uh, uh, view of the world is we try and save it. Yeah, we try and save what we're actually sort of contributing to. Uh, very, very sort of, and this is, this is where the mixed uh, impacts of a lot of uh, altruistic work uh, sort of stems from. So what instead we have is a vision of the potential of all beings. Um, and therefore we're seeing them, we're invited to see them as uh, in their capacity to grow in their capacity to grow towards our common uh, human potential, um, grow towards enlightenment. And that actually, that is the only real basis for unity in the world. That is what Buddhism, I believe, is saying. So that's the first uh, level of uh, Bodhisattva. Um, <clears throat> so it provides us with a vision of how the love mode sees the world. It's really, really quite important if we want to help the world. And then the second, um, the second uh, kind of bodhisattva, uh, aspirants, us. So, um, what, so this is where I want to come closer to our topic. What is actually happening in spiritual community? <clears throat> uh, and I want to draw on the image uh, from the Vimalakirti Nadesha. So, we find ourselves in, um, <clears throat> in an extraordinary world, as I said. We find ourselves in front of the Buddha. We see the Buddha, but gathered on the Buddha is a magnificent assembly uh, of archetypal bodhisattvas, of monks, uh, of nuns, uh, of uh, a fantastic assembly of uh, bodhisattvas, all gathering to hear the Buddha teach the Dharma. That's where we find ourselves, uh, suddenly. And um, as the Buddha is about to teach the assembly, the assembly, the assembly sort of silent, rapt, waiting for the words of the Buddha, uh, the teaching uh, of the Buddha, uh, 500 latecomers turn up. So the 500, uh, well, actually led by Ratnakara, uh, the leader of a particular sangha, specific sangha, uh, who come from Vaishali, called the Lichavis, uh, these elegant youths. And they arrive, each carrying a magnificent parasol. So can you imagine that? Like 500 strong sangha turn up, and each of them is carrying a parasol. Um, <clears throat> and uh, each of them, what they do is they circumambulate the Buddha. They bow to the Buddha, circumambulate the Buddha, and offer their beautiful parasol to the Buddha and then retire to sit at one side of the Buddha. Now, it does help to know something about the history uh, or the context. Uh, what is a parasol sort of symbolizing there? Well, parasols, it's a beautiful image, isn't it? This kind of um, uh, beautiful thing that sort of fans out above us. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, they're used by royalty. It's a symbol of royalty and therefore nobility and therefore kind of high aspiration. Uh, 
so that's what it means. And then you also, it's also helpful to know that in Buddhism, an offering uh, is necessarily aspirational. Uh, so you offer things to the Buddha to become like the Buddha. So an offering is, is, is aspirational, is, is an expression of an aspiration. So here we are with these kind of noble, beautiful, noble aspirations all offered to the Buddha. One after another, after another, after another, 500 strong, uh, all circumambulate the Buddha, offer their parasites to the Buddha and sit down to one side. And when that has happened, when that's, uh, when those offerings have been completed, uh, the Buddha uh, gives us a teaching. He magically transforms those, uh, those parasols into one ginormous uh, parasol. So what on earth is happening here? Uh, so this, this ginormous parasol that's so, so large that it covers the entire billion world galaxy. So, what's more, everybody in the assembly, look, when they look up into the, uh, the parasol, uh, they can see uh, reflected in the interior all of the worlds, all of the galaxies, all of the worlds, um, <clears throat> all of the solar systems um, reflected back to them. They can see all of the mountains, all of the rivers, all of the lakes in all of these worlds. They can see all of the cities, all of the towns, all of the villages. They can see all beings, all beings everywhere in the interior of this magnificent parasol. And the whole assembly are amazed, astounded uh, by this teaching. Uh, of the Buddha by this beautiful magical feat. So what is this all about? <laughs> beautiful as it may be, what relevance has this got to our question? Uh, well what happens just after that is actually Ratnakara sings uh, uh, some verses of praise of the Buddha and straight after that he asks the Buddha a question. He gives voice to the question of the whole Sangha of the Lichavis. Uh, which is, what is the purification of the Buddha field, i.e., how do you build a Buddha land? How do you create a Buddha field? So this gives expression to the altruistic uh, impulse, uh, aspiration, al altruistic nature of the Sangha of the Lichavis. So that's our, that's our image, that's our symbol. Uh, probably many of us have heard of it uh, before. Uh, it's an extraordinary image, isn't it? Uh, it's an absolutely extraordinary image. Uh, quite compelling, but quite strange. Um, and in a certain way, I don't understand it. I don't understand it, but I find it compelling. Uh, I find it inspires me. Um, but one thing that it reminds me of is my first experience uh, of the Sangha. Um, <clears throat> so, what I, what I, oh yeah, sorry, I should say one more thing, and that is what Sangharachita says about this, which is very helpful. Uh, <laughs> so he says, uh, what this is getting at is, to the extent that our um, aspirations have a common object, is the extent to which we are united. The extent to which we are united is the extent to which we are a force for good in the world. Yeah. So what I want to talk about is um, <clears throat> aspirations and unity um, first, and then this aspect of, uh, to the extent to which we are united, we will be a force for good in the world. Um, so first of all, aspirations and unity. Um, and as I say, it, bring, it brings me to mind of my early experience of Sangha. So, um, I came along, first came along to Tree Ratna Centre over 20 years ago uh, in Sheffield. Um, and I remember at one point um, encountering um, uh, an interaction, in fact a number of interactions, but there's one particular in my mind, between an order member and a Mitra. And it was strange, it was strange. They, they communicated in a way that was somehow different from what I was used to seeing. 
and it was compelling. I was fascinated by it. Uh, I couldn't, for the life of me, make sense of what was going on. Um, it was both encouraging and challenging at the same time. So I remember this order member, uh, Omoga Vangsa, and this Mitra Lotti, who I think she'd asked for ordination at the time, she's now called Vidya Badri, um, talking. And there was something about the way they were talking that was compelling. Um, it was encouraging and challenging. Now, I'd come across encouraging and challenging before. Uh, my climbing community were like that, uh, encouraging and challenging. But this was different. Um, in a climbing community, uh, it's like that on the wall when you're climbing. But when you go home, it's not like that. Now, this was getting closer uh, in to life. Uh, it was encouraging and challenging about something more central to them uh, than just a hobby. It touched all of their life somehow. Um, <clears throat> um, so there was some kind of some kind of unity between them. Uh, another another kind of unity I'd seen is is the unity of a common project. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, when you when you're involved in a common project with other people. Um, but this was different from that too. Uh, a common project. Uh, you need at some level to accommodate yourself to the project, uh, subordinate uh, yourself to the project. Uh, it's that that brings you together. Well, this was different. This was based in their personal aspirations. What they hold, held most dear uh, in their lives, that was the basis of their unity, their, their aspirations. They aspired to the same thing. And that meant that when they encouraged and uh, um, challenged each other, it wasn't just a matter of sort of improved productivity, a better project. Actually, it meant uh, that they became more themselves. So there was something shared, some, some kind of unity, but somehow um, that unity was also their individuality. It's very, very odd sort of... Um, Thing to sort of see, but somehow I could kind of pick that up in what was going on. Uh, it was it was it was much more metaphoric. I just saw them sort of leaning into each other, sort of psychically, encouraging and challenging. But somehow, the more they did that, the more I saw them kind of communicating. Uh, the more their aspirations sort of grew. It was like their aspirations were sort of cumulative, uh, they sort of added together, they sort of combined somehow. I'd never seen that before. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to communicate sort of through metaphor an experience that, I, that was just strange to me, strange but compelling. I couldn't quite make sense of it. But that was this, this imaginal language somehow helps me uh, to articulate it. Somehow, um, uh, this very, very personally held uh, aspiration, what was most important to them, were kind of leaning together and sort of combining uh, in a way that actually increased each other's individual aspiration. Um, so that, that I think probably when I came across this image was sort of uh, conditioning my, my interest in, that, in the image. So um, <clears throat> what they had was a common, was a common object, um, <clears throat> and uh, they had a common practice, and they had a common language. And that allowed them to do something that I'd never seen happen uh, before. It allowed Sangha to emerge. I have actually worked with another Buddhist uh, who I didn't have a common language or common practice with, and it wasn't possible. It wasn't possible. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, moving on to force for good in the world. I just want to make a few points, to, uh, three points about this. So, um, <clears throat> uh, when we think about uh, forces in the world, uh, when we, our go-to influence for change is often politics, isn't it? That's what we think is going to make a change uh, in the world. Well, Sangha is a more subtle influence uh, than politics. Um, <clears throat> Politics is keeping us pinned in our homes at the moment, isn't it? Uh, we can see the sort of power, the influence of politics. Uh, but because the influence of Sangha is subtle, we mistakenly think it's sort of feeble. 
we mistake subtlety for feebleness. Uh, and that is not necessarily the case. Uh, something can be subtle, uh, but powerful, perhaps even more powerful. Interestingly, Sangharatsta says something like, the love mode will always overcome the power mode. Uh, there's further reflection. Um, so, um, because it's subtle, we tend to think it's sort of weak. We tend to underestimate it. Um, <clears throat> but one of the reasons why we underestimate it is because um, it's, uh, we, we've sort of got this image of kind of strong arm influence of politics uh, in the back of our mind. Well, actually, Sanger isn't like that. Uh, Sanger influences uh, through consent. We consent to the influence of Sanger. It's happening now. Uh, there is a powerful influence kind of going on at Sangonite, but we consent to it. So we don't think of it as a sort of power, uh, but it's nonetheless got a strong potency. Um, <clears throat> so um, I just keep an eye on time. Um, so I have managed to uh, get delayed. Um, yeah, perhaps just a little example of, of this influence. Uh, for me, uh, so uh, in this third, this third lockdown that we've, uh, we've been cast into, um, <clears throat> um, I uh, decided, uh, my girlfriend actually decided uh, that we were going to take the restrictions absolutely literally. We decided that on the basis of uh, the death count. There were so many people dying. Um, and uh, the, the pressure on the NHS uh, to deal with uh, those people. We simply did not want to contribute uh, any more uh, to either contribute sort of uh, potentially uh, or in reality, you know, somebody getting ill. Um, and uh, part of that was, uh, part of that was um, that I've seen uh, that the way I act influences other people. If I kind of... Um, uh, take my own version of the, uh, the restrictions, uh, <laughs> that influences other people to sort of make their own accommodating sort of version of the restrictions. If I um, act on value, um, as I was trying to hear, then that influences other people. So um, that was, that's been my experience. Uh, so I instead wanted to uh, take a, a great inconvenience to myself and my girlfriend, take them quite literally. We live in different houses. Um, uh, so that's been, that's been very awkward. Um, but uh, again, I'm sort of affected by the aspirations of people around me. It's this sort of, um, I can't quite say whether in a way it's my sort of aspiration there um, <clears throat> to... Um, the love mode to consider other people in solidarity with the NHS. Um, that is that, that I'm trying to sort of protect other people or whether it's me that's influenced by um, um, other people's aspirations um, uh, and uh, I'm sort of positively affected, positively uplifted to act in that sort of way. There's this sort of, um, this strange kind of combining uh, of aspirations again. Um, <clears throat> so there, a kind of subtle influence, a subtle influence on me, or is the influence going from me to other people? Uh, this sort of subtle influence kind of combining. Uh, so this is uh, the power, uh, the potency of Sangha uh, at work. Um, <clears throat> this is the potency of the love mode. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to need to... Uh, wrap, start to wrap up. Um, so yeah, uh, last last two points about this. Um, uh, so in order really to uh, make a difference in the world, in order to really be a force for good in the world, in terms of the love mode, uh, you need to commit to a specific uh, spiritual community. There's no other way to do it. Uh, now, the reason I'm saying this is because actually the love mode is very, very profound. The shift from the power mode uh, to the love mode, um, Sangha actually compares to a shift uh, so large it's equivalent to a shift in your center of gravity. Um, so what spiritual community is, in large part, is a training ground. Um, through practicing spiritual community, we come into contact with other people. Uh, and who are trying to practice the love mode. 
and uh, uh, what happens is the ways in our power mode uh, sort of habits come to light. Uh, I've been um, a Buddhist for over 20 years now and uh, just recently uh, a habit of mine sort of surfaced into awareness, um, <clears throat> a sort of preoccupation with fairness. It's like suddenly I'm an 11 year old and I'm upset because my brother is getting away with not doing the washing up again and uh, <laughs> suddenly that's, that's actually where I am but this is only just resurfaced into awareness. Prior to that, I wasn't aware of it, so it was affecting my actions. Uh, somehow, subtly, uh, or perhaps not so subtly, I was working in the power mode. So it's only through, it was only through kind of intensive contact with the Sangha that that, to me, uh, came to light after 20 years. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an ongoing, continuous process. So we need a training ground. But the other side of it is uh, that we become a force. Um, so the Sangha um, uh, becomes a force. Uh, there's so much kind of happening uh, through the Sangha that we don't even see. So many people meeting up in friendship that you may never see uh, around here. People uh, meditating on the street, um, <clears throat> study groups, uh, people helping the homeless. There's all sorts of things going on. So unity frees up energy. Uh, I was in a meeting with a, a few people. It's just so, so good, uh, all volunteers, to be um, working with people who really care about what they're doing. It just freed up energy. It was a delight uh, to work. Uh, so that's really what's sort of happening at the, uh, at the center. This unity sort of frees up energy and we can become a force for good in the world. Um, okay, so... Um, yet yeah, last point, um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the difficulties is that uh, the power mode is the mode of the world. Yeah, that's the predominant mode of the world. Uh, that's our familiar mode. Um, so we can't actually completely eschew it. Um, <clears throat> um, at the same time, if we're working in the power mode, uh, that is mutually exclusive with the love mode. So we're either functioning through one or functioning through the other. And uh, if we function in the love mode or in the power mode rather, then that will tend to invite that back from the world, from anybody else. If we function in the love mode, that uh, is more likely uh, to encourage someone else to act in accordance with the love mode. So... That puts us in a kind of complicated position as a spiritual community. Um, <clears throat> but it means that the way we uh, can influence the world, the way we can wield this influence uh, of Sangha is through exemplification. Uh, by exemplifying, we can influence uh, the world. Um, <clears throat> and our influence is much, much larger than we realize. Uh, if you practice Sangha, you increase your potency uh, to influence the world. Um, however, uh, for us, it's comparatively small. And that's where we move on to our last um, uh, kind of bodhisattva, uh, people who've made significant spiritual progress. So I'm talking about people like Sangha Akshita, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, who have positively influenced the lives of literally millions of people. So one of the reasons why we underestimate uh, the influence of Sangha is because real unity, uh, people who are genuinely established um, irreversibly in this unity, uh, are very rare. Uh, but when you see what they are capable of doing, when you see what uh, Sangha Rakshita and Begka, uh, many others, have done, they can uh, influence the lives of millions and millions of people. Um, but this influence is an influence to which they consent. They are not forced into it. It's an influence to which what they consent. So we overlook it. We tend to, to uh, be preoccupied with the dramatic, uh, the forceful, uh, the violent. So um, that's why I'm going to leave it. I, but I want to leave you with that image, coming back to that image of that, that magnificent uh, parasol. Somehow, um, 
it doesn't just unite, our aspirations don't just unite, it brings us into contact with the rest of the world. And actually, that was the effect for me of taking the restrictions uh, so, so seriously uh, in this last lockdown. I was put back in touch with that experience of solidarity with the rest of humanity uh, that was there in the first lockdown. So we have the ability uh, to bring that into being. In the first lockdown, it was to a large extent sort of conditioned by circumstances, uh, but actually Sangha is taking um, responsibility for creating the conditions that can bring something beautiful, uh, something very inspiring, a new potent influence in the world. And that is what Sangha, the significance of Sangha is. So I'll stop there because I've gone, I've gone five minutes over. Um, <clears throat> But I want to leave you now with some questions uh, about this. So um, the questions uh, are for you to explore further. What is happening in spiritual community? So I want to ask you, what have you noticed about Sangha? What have you noticed about distinctive, uh, about uh, the communication between Buddhists, whether that be order members and mitras or um, Buddhists, yeah? That's the first question. What have you noticed uh, about Sangha, or about the communication between Buddhists? Second question, what do you make of this idea that you need to commit, you need to narrow down <laughs> uh, committing to one specific spiritual community in order to uh, broaden out and have a positive influence on the world? Sounds kind of on the face of it contradictory, but what do you think to that idea that you need to narrow down and commit to a specific spiritual community in order to have to be a force for good in the world. And then the third one, do you see the influence of spiritual community as potent, as powerful, or do you see it as sort of feeble and the power mode as strong? So uh, in a moment, Jeremy will press the magic button and we'll explore further uh, what is happening in spiritual community. <clears throat> 